All right, so it is good. Well, I think we're going to flash it up here. Actually, um, on, uh, on the sheet is uh, my email address. If you would like to have a copy of the Old Testament notes from last year, I really feel bad. The Old Testament is much longer than the, Old Test- uh, the New Testament, and I think I only gave you about 25 pages of notes on the Old Testament. And we have 51 pages of notes on the New Testament, which is much shorter. But um, um, I, I wrote out more uh, this time, knowing we're going to have to skim over some things uh, fairly quickly. And if you're close enough, you can somewhat follow along as I point, uh, point some things out as we go um, through the, uh, the outline. Uh, it was just a year ago, right after the uh, Summer Institute was over, that Louise and I went to, uh, to Ireland uh, to meet two of our alumni that are ministering, one in Northern Ireland, so he's a part of the UK, and we enjoyed some, uh, some time with him and then went to the Republic of Ireland. And as we were flying back, and uh, if you ever look up into the sky, that if the winds are right and uh, you come in on the right flight pattern, you can actually land at Heathrow and come right over the center of London. And uh, since we get to choose our seats, I always choose a window seat on the right side of the plane, hoping to get a, a look at downtown London. Now, sometimes you have to do the Heath, Heathrow circles and you're, you're way away and together they kind of zoom you in. Uh, uh, but every once in a while, you, you get to get that slow look at downtown London. And coming back from Ireland last year, that's exactly what happened. And not only were we were on the right flight path, but there was also no clouds, which is also a miracle in London, as you know. And so it was a, very, it was a crystal clear day. And so I said, honey, hand me the camera. And so at about 15,000 feet above the chapel, I took about three snapshots. And um, yeah, that, that, at, at that height, you're just snapping pictures, hoping something comes out. And got back to California, looked out on the computer, and one picture was crystal clear. Um, yeah, and was able to find the eye and uh, the tower. And, and the nice thing about the computer is you can start zooming in. Yeah, so you get the big picture and you keep zooming in and zooming in and zooming in until we found the chapel, Christ Life London, from 12,000 feet. Now, that's what we're going to be doing. We are, we're going to be up at 12,000 feet, you know, for the next uh, 10 hours uh, each evening this week. And uh, I'm glad that you've got a chance to zoom down. Now, what Dr. Harris has done is he's, you know, he's kept hitting the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the button that gets you closer da, 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 to start to, to analyze and look at more of the detail. But uh, we're going we're, we're gonna to try to take a big picture. One of the things that uh, revolutionized my life is, uh, is sitting down and having read through the Bible a number of times, uh, and then going to seminary and being challenged to read a book at a time. I think you've probably heard that challenge from Dr. Harris. But then, as I started to teach, to start to read blocks of book at a, of a time. And, and, and really, you know, the New Testament is only 400 pages. And... Uh, and so if you would just take 10 to 20 pages a day, you, you can get the whole New Testament read in a month or two. Uh, and particularly after reading the Old Testament, the New Testament is very short, very quick as far as reading it. And um, so I would, uh, I would encourage you, uh, take some Saturday afternoon, turn the soccer game off, the football game, uh, take it to the cricket match because you'll have plenty of time anyway. <laughs> And uh, just read through the four Gospels. You can do it in about four to five hours. So I'd encourage you to do that. You, you will see things you've never seen, you know, at ground level 
when you zoom high and take a look at it from that perspective. And that's what we want to do in uh, the time that we have uh, together. Now, certainly we need to uh, start to, to get familiar with the New Testament itself. And uh, so the introduction is, is basically the background material that you need to know to, uh, to understand the New Testament. Now, I don't know if you know it, today is the 100th anniversary of Great Britain's entrance into World War I, August 4th, 1914, is when Great Britain declared war. And uh, my grand both of my grandfathers fought in World War I. And so literally, we're three, four, five generations. And, and as is a lot of reflection, uh, historians are saying, you know, you really can't understand modern-day Britain. You can't understand modern-day Europe without understanding what happened in 1914 to 1918. And they're right. It, it, it changed, basically, the complexion of Europe. And, uh, and between the Old and New Testament are 400 years. Not 100, 400 years. And of course, uh, great changes took place, which uh, impacted what we read in the New Testament. But now we're 2,000 years beyond. And I start the New Testament survey in the same way as the Old Testament survey. That we have a problem as we start to read the New Testament. And that is we enter into an alien world. Now, it's not quite as alien as the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we enter into a, a world of, of the ancient Near East. Uh, in the New Testament, we enter into a world of the Roman Empire. And particularly here in the UK, uh, you know that the, uh, the Romans... Uh, a couple of generations after the New Testament came to uh, the southern part of, uh, of the UK to basically what is today uh, England, and, and we're here. You, you've seen Roman relics, and uh, so you're a little close, but nevertheless, you realize it was a, a different world. And uh, the more you can know about the, uh, the background of this world you enter, and so you begin to read uh, the New Testament. And I think you've already hit it with Dr. Harris. Uh, you, you start to read about scribes and Pharisees, Sadducees, priests, elders, uh, Jesus going into a synagogue. And uh, you realize these aren't things that you run into day by day. And so you have a, a real problem even as you begin to read the New Testament. Uh, what are these institutions? Who are these people? Where did they come from? And uh, though you've hit some geographical terms that you're familiar with, Rome, Corinth, Spain, uh, there are other names that uh, you see, uh, uh, Laodicea, um, uh, Pergamum, etc. You're reading and you have the faintest idea where those places are. And so there is a, a problem basically reading. The more you can know about background, uh, the better you can understand. And then the problem of interpreting the New Testament, because to understand what you're reading, to interpret accurately what you're reading, means that you've got to think like the audiences to which the New Testament was originally written. That the better you can understand their circumstances, their life, the better you can understand how what was written to them had meaning and what the proper interpretation is. Uh, significantly, we, we call our interpretive process the grammatical, historical, hermeneutic. And uh, so, now we won't get into grammar, that's, that's enough in itself of uh, knowing, uh, you know, basic uh, grammatical concepts. But even the history is a vital part of, of understanding. And then seeing the relevance of the New Testament to the contemporary Christian believer. All right, ladies, you, you read in uh, 1 Corinthians and 
Don't worry, Pastor Tom is going to solve all your problems on what does it mean to have a head covering in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. What does it mean, 2 Corinthians 13, to greet each other with a holy kiss? Uh, what do these things mean? Um, even as you, you think in terms of uh, going through uh, the Gospels, um, uh, uh, certain things that Jesus, the disciples, do, what, what relevance does that have to me? I mean, okay, so they regularly went to the synagogue. What relevance does that have to me? So as much as you can know, and at the very back, I've given you some resources, three that are there on uh, giving you some history that you can read. Ferguson, if you want the big, monstrous one. Uh, but then Julius Scott, Merrill Tenney have uh, much more readable uh, background books uh, to give you a lot of historical background as far as the New Testament is concerned. Well, what is uh, that, uh, that historical background? I'm going to fly through this very, very quickly. Try, trying just to establish the, um, uh, the context historically as we come to the New Testament. And uh, the first thing we need to realize, we're reading the Bible. And so we need to think in terms of the Jewish background. Uh, through, through the Old Testament, even though empires waxed and waned, uh, they, they arose, dominant powers, and uh, then were defeated, and other nations uh, uh, had uh, empires. That, the, that the, the link as you go through the Old Testament is the, is the line of Abraham, the line of Jacob slash Israel, the ultimate nation of Israel, that as you're going through the Old Testament, that's the constant. The constant is Israel. And really, in the first half of the New Testament, it continues in the same way. That from Matthew chapter 1 to Acts chapter 12, you continue to read basically what God was doing with the Jewish people, with the nation of Israel. And so, particularly, you want to know something about the Jewish background. Now, beginning in Acts chapter 13, everything changes. And in Acts chapter 13, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, sets apart for ministry Paul and Barnabas from the church at Antioch and uh, sends them on missionary journeys and through Paul's preaching of the gospel, Paul being uniquely called by Jesus Christ, Acts chapter 9, at the very call of, of uh, the apostle Paul, uh, the Lord let him know that he was going to suffer many things and he was going to proclaim the gospel to the nations and before kings and that's exactly what happens. Paul becomes a great apostle to the Gentiles. And uh, the gospel basically then, uh, from Acts 13 on, predominantly reaches Gentiles. And, uh, and the, uh, the New Testament takes on a Gentile flavor as uh, the gospel goes forth. And most of the churches, most of the individuals addressed in the latter part of the New Testament have a Gentile background. Significantly, when we get there, the, the man responsible for more of the New Testament by word counts than any other author was not Paul. The, the man, it, it's, it's in your notes, you don't have to jot it down, it's there, you'll read it sooner or later. But uh, the man who was responsible for more of the New Testament than any other man was Luke. And Luke is significant. He's the only Gentile writer of Scripture, Old or New Testament. So a Gentile was the one responsible. And then, of course, you add Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, a, uh, a, a man obviously well-steeped in Old Testament understanding and, uh, and Judaism, and uh, how God then sent him to... Uh, the two, the Gentiles. But what I'm trying to say through all this is you've you got to see this Jewish strand, even as you're going through the Gospel of Mark, which was written for a Gentile audience, but it speaks much, obviously, of Jesus and his interaction with the Jews when he was here upon the earth. So 
to learn something of the Jewish background. And, and the Old Testament ends during the time of the Persian Empire. And uh, from 538 BC, with the decree of Cyrus recorded in Ezra 1 and 2 Chronicles chapter 36, Cyrus the Persian allow the Israelites to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Now, only a small remnant did so. Uh, there was only 50,000 Jews at most that uh, over the, the next few generations went from the different areas uh, east of uh, Jerusalem and came back to Jerusalem and uh, the area right around it. And so uh, we end the Old Testament during the time of the Persian Empire, the Persian period. And, uh, and the latter part of the Old Testament is written during the time of the dominance of the Persian Empire. And uh, that the history comes through in Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, with Nehemiah being a cupbearer to the king, part of the, of the royal uh, uh, officialdom it goes back to, uh, to Judah and uh, with the end of his governorship with the end of uh, that time period then we start to see the weakening of the Persian Empire this is post Old Testament and uh, ab about uh, 70 years after the Old Testament comes to an end we enter into what is known as the Hellenistic period and uh, this is where the Persian Empire was defeated by the Greeks a particular Greek, well-known, Alexander the Great. And uh, Alexander is one of those important people in world history. For not only did he defeat the Persian Empire, but what he sought to do was to change the whole complexion of the Middle East from its, from its previous... Uh, uh, heritage and culture culminating in the Persians and uh, change it into a Greek speaking Greek thinking area and uh, some have said that's the, when the battle between East and West between Europe and the Middle East really began with Alexander the Great and of course that has not yet come to an end uh, as we know but that was Alexander. Alexander tried to force his culture down the throats of his conquered people. And it did not go too well. Uh, after his, his death, his uh, conquest was divided uh, among his generals and uh, the Ptolemies. Ptolemy I uh, took over in Egypt. And then ultimately, one of the generals of Ptolemy named Seleucid uh, took over in Syria. And, uh, you know, modern day uh, Syria, uh, modern day Egypt, pretty much the boundaries along the Mediterranean. And uh, you can see then, if you think about geography as it is today, Israel is squeezed in right between the two. And so from 320 to 198 B.C., it was the Ptolemies who controlled the Jews in Jerusalem. And then later in 198 to 142 B.C., it was the Seleucids from the north uh, centered in uh, Antioch who controlled them. And uh, Daniel chapter uh, 8, a uh, man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, the little horn of Daniel chapter 8, and Daniel prophesied. He prophesied the fact that Greece would conquer the Persians. And uh, from, the, from the Greek goat, a, a horn would arise, a little horn who would boast and uh, seek to change the religious persuasion of the Jews. And historically, that individual was known as Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, I, uh, Antiochus the... The, the bright, shining one, Epiphanes. And, uh, and he literally did that. Through some circumstances, uh, Rome withstood his assault into Egypt. 
And uh, so he took out his frustrations upon Israel. He, uh, he, he burned copies of the Torah. He, uh, he outlawed the keeping of the Sabbath. And uh, most importantly, he went to Jerusalem and put uh, pagan standards in the temple court and offered a pig on the Jewish altar. And that was going too far. And uh, so the Jews rebelled against Antiochus in what is known as the Maccabean Revolt. And uh, in 164, they were able to retake the temple, cleanse it, and ultimately by 142 BC have been able to overthrow the uh, Seleucids with tremendous help from a party to the West known as Rome. Rome declared the Hasmoneans friends of Rome, which means that anyone that uh, would uh, look and seek to defeat the Hasmoneans as uh, the leaders of the Maccabean revolt, their family name, uh, became known. And so they had a period of independence and actually expanded uh, their, their rule from Jerusalem, even north into the area around the Sea of Galilee, known as Galilee. It was during this time, 142 to 63 BC, when basically the boundaries of Israel we find in the New Testament came to be. And it was all under the protection of Rome. Now, Rome was the power, as it were, behind the scenes with the Hasmoneans, and uh, when there was a battle over the high priesthood, both of the pretenders for the priesthood appealed to Rome. And uh, so in 63 BC, the Romans just came in and took over. Uh, they liked to work through, uh, uh, through uh, local uh, chieftains, obviously, in, uh, in Jerusalem through the, the high priestly family and the Hasmoneans. Uh, were the protectors and took over the high priesthood uh, during their rule. But of course, when there's inner strife, Rome didn't like that. They just came in and took over uh, the, the Jews. So that became, in fact, what had really been taking place for a few generations. And, and look for a, a new group, a new individual that uh, they could rule through. And they found it in a man by the name of Antipa. Antipa was Idumean, ancestor of Esau, the Edomites, loyal to Rome, but also pledging himself to the Jewish religion. And so uh, the Romans um, looked to him uh, to control the land, and then he had some sons. And one of those sons was named Herod, who in 40 BC was declared by the Roman Senate to be the king of the Jews. Now, when you come to, yeah, when you come to Matthew chapter 2, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And, Rome, and Herod has a heart attack? Huh? You know, he was, uh, he was uh, dismayed and all Jerusalem with him. I mean, if Herod is not happy, Jerusalem is not happy. But who is he born king of the Jews? I mean, now you got to realize Herod was king of the Jews because of Roman decree. Now there's one born king of the Jews, and of course, that's why Herod wants to get rid of him. He realizes he is a threat to his throne. So you can see how even the history helps you start to understand passages that uh, are in the, uh, the New Testament. But the reign of Herod the Great... And of course, if you've read the Christmas story, you know all about Herod the Great, and I know that you have. And uh, then after his death, at the end of Matthew chapter 2, he is in 4 BC, his, uh, his kingdom was divided among his sons, and, um, and his uh, son Archelaus uh, was, had all of uh, Herod's faults, none of his uh, uh, strengths, and was replaced by Roman governors from AD 6 onward except for a short time under Herod, Gripper I, the grandson of Herod, who ruled over the same domain as, as his grandfather from AD 41 to 44. But basically, at that point, Jerusalem and Judea is under Roman governors. But Galilee was, a, was another area 
that was under Herod Antipas, another son of Herod. And so in the Gospels, when Jesus moves from Galilee to Jerusalem, he moves from one sphere of Roman control, a client king in Galilee, and then comes to Jerusalem, Judea, and now he's directly under the authority of the Roman governor who exercised the authority in the city of Jerusalem. So that's one of the things we need to realize, that, that even though Jesus is among the Jews, it's, uh, it's, it's like he, when he's in Galilee, he was in Scotland, and uh, then when he went to Jerusalem, it was like he was in England. It's all part of the same Roman Empire, uh, but you know, the Scots uh, don't feel themselves to be quite as English as the English. And uh, I don't know, have we had the vote yet to figure out what's going to be an independent Scotland? I guess uh, um, I, I know when we were here in May, they were picketing that they wanted a free Scotland. And I said, free Scotland, you're going to pay taxes either way. So uh, it's, it's not free. But uh, um, that was free. Uh, <laughs> So where, where are the taxes going? That's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much what it was. Uh, Rome still got all the money, but who collected the taxes? Was it a tax collectors hired by Herod Agrippa? I mean, I'm sorry, Herod Antipas in uh, Galilee, or was it the tax collectors collecting directly for the Roman governor in, in uh, Jerusalem? Didn't make any difference. In the end, Rome got the money. Rome was in control, but there was a little different bureaucracy in, uh, in the two areas. Now, what I've done with this chart is, uh, is, is help you understand the, the crises because the second temple wasn't destroyed until A.D. 70. Until, as we'll see, most of the New Testament was written. And uh, during that time, the, the Jews went through five major crises. Uh, the, the first one was in the Old Testament itself. And in fact, in Ezra chapter 4, you have a, a survey of the opposition that arose in the Persian Empire to what was taking place in Jerusalem. And so, this was the, this was the first crisis of the Second Temple period. Even though the Second Temple had been built, it uh, was built with great amount of opposition and even after it had been built, the opposition continued uh, from the parties, the other peoples in the land around uh, Jerusalem who sought to negate the influence of the Jews. Then second, we've already talked about with the collapse of the Persian Empire, the influence of Hellenism after Alexander the Great. And, uh, and, and Jews, particularly young men within Judaism, had to determine, are we going to follow Greek ways so that we might have some influence, prosperity? Or are we going to hold fast to our Jewish traditions, which means we'll be second-class citizens? And then the violent persecution by Antiochus Epiphanes, and as I said, already predicted in Daniel 8 and again in Daniel chapter 11. And then by the time we get to the New Testament, the domination of Palestine by Rome. And the almost 80-year independence under the Hasmoneans had given them the sense that, well, maybe God was going to finally fulfill his promises and uh, bring a political restoration to, to Israel. And then that was all dampered by the Romans coming in every, every, with a heavy hand in controlling them, and so there was a lot of anti-Roman sentiment among the people by the time you get to the, to the New Testament. And that's why you get into certain passages, particularly of John chapter 6, that the people saw Jesus as a, as a political leader, one who, who his kingship was first and foremost to come and defeat the Romans and reestablish the Davidic rule in in uh, Israel. And of course, it was under David and Solomon in the Old Testament where Israel was at, its, was, at, what it, was at its height. And then toward the end of the, the New Testament, we have the Roman destruction of the temple. And uh, that was the end of Jerusalem. And a later 
Rebellion, 132 to 135 AD, known as the Bar Kopa Rebellion, and uh, basically the Jews were banned from Palestine, a, uh, a ban that uh, really uh, was in effect for about 1,800 years, and only toward the end of the 19th and then the 20th century did Jews start to fill the back into, uh, into the land. So, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem was a, was a major, major issue. And, uh, and uh, we'll come back to that because the destruction of Jerusalem, I believe, plays a very important role in, uh, in uh, the Gospel of John and why the Gospel of John came to be written. Well, along with that, we also have to realize, we've already seen it, that by the time we get to the New Testament, we have to think about what's happening among the Jews. Uh, but Rome, at that point, controlled Palestine, and of course, control the whole area around the Mediterranean. And, uh, and it's uh, significant, and I have uh, selected, obviously, uh, the Roman Empire uh, grew in uh, different steps as the Roman army uh, had its uh, conquests uh, from uh, the third century BC all the way to just before the New Testament era with the final establishment of the Roman province of Galatia. But I particularly put here the, the areas that became very important as far as the New Testament. Macedonia was conquered in 168 BC. And Paul is going to have a significant impact upon Macedonia. Macedonia is where the cities of Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea were. And of course, uh, he evangelized those cities. And by 146, they controlled Achaia. And uh, two major cities in Achaia, Athens and Corinth. And of course, Corinth is, uh, well, you know about Corinth from 1 Corinthians. All right, so Achaia. And then by 133, uh, they had control of uh, what they called Asia. Now, Asia is not what we call Asia. That's the westernmost part of modern-day Turkey. And, of course, the, the dominant religious center in Asia was the city of Ephesus, again, where Paul would have a very extensive ministry. 63 B.C., the three... Uh, the legions, and then three legions were stationed in Syria. The major city of Syria was Antioch. And of course, it's from the church at Antioch where the apostle Paul was sent out on his uh, three missionary journeys. We've already talked about Palestine. And then uh, uh, finally having land ceded to it by client kings uh, in 25 B.C., the the Romans uh, put together what we now know as uh, Galatia, and obviously the letter of the Galatians. And the southern part of the Roman province of Galatia is where Paul evangelized on his first missionary journey. So this is uh, the area, and so we can see that, obviously again, by the time we get to the New Testament, to the Apostle Paul, 35 AD and following, as uh, the gospel is ready to, to break out of Palestine into the... Gentile world, that God had already brought it together all under Roman control, domination, just as uh, was true in, uh, in Palestine. Now, what this did, because it's interesting that Galatians 4.4 4 says that Jesus Christ came in the fullness of time. God had prepared the world for the coming of Jesus Christ and the going forth of the gospel uniquely. Because if, if Christ had been born a hundred years before, Paul never would have been able to freely travel to the areas that he did. If Christ had come 200 years after he did, same thing was true as the Roman Empire was starting to, to break up. And so Christ came at that exact point of time where it was most advantageous for the gospel to go along the Roman roads. And uh, Paul, being a Roman citizen, was able to travel freely from place to place 
Um, the eastern part of the Roman Empire, Greek had become the dominant language in the West, Latin. And uh, it's interesting that the gospel only got as far as Rome, basically, where the distinction between Greek and Latin, uh, as far as predominant language, uh, uh, changed. And uh, so we don't have to learn Latin to read the New Testament. Many of us praise the Lord for that. Uh, uh, just have to learn Greek, Koine Greek. Uh, because if, um, if Paul would have sent a letter to the churches of Spain, which believe that he evangelized, or ultimately if letters came to the churches in Britain, they would have been in Latin, not in Greek. So, um, so it's important to understand a little bit about what was happening as far as the Roman Empire. And of course, that's because they, they were powerful, but they loved Greek culture. So they allowed the Greek language to survive, particularly among the, the highly educated classes of the, uh, the Romans and continue to be the, the basic language of trade in the East, Latin in the West. And then during the New Testament era, 11 different Roman emperors and uh, a number of these are given by name in the New Testament. Augustus, and uh, you all know that from the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. In the days of Caesar Augustus, they went forth to decree. All right? Augustus is the first emperor of the Roman Empire, ruled from 27 B.C. to A.D. 14. Followed by Tiberius, an adopted son, not a natural born son. And it was uh, during the days of Tiberius when John the Baptist and then Jesus had their ministries. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Between Tiberius and Claudius is a man named Caligula, one of the worst of the Roman uh, emperors but followed by an uncle, Claudius. And Claudius is mentioned in Acts chapter 18. He is the one who issued the decree uh, that uh, the Romans in uh, AD uh, 49 issued a decree that the Jews should lead Rome. And it was because of that decree that uh, Priscilla and Aquila came to Corinth and met in Corinth the apostle Paul. Now, Nero is not mentioned by name in the New Testament. But it's interesting, when you read Romans 13, and Paul told the believers at Rome to be submissive to the governing authorities, you know who was emperor at that time? Nero. And you know what Nero ultimately did to the Christians? He persecuted them. And uh, so he's not mentioned by name. Uh, sorry about it. Well, let's, we'll put him there. You We're talking about these, these right there. And, um, and uh, significantly, uh, Romans 13, Nero is the emperor. Then we have, as you can see, 68 to 69, we have the year of the four emperors. Uh, Nero persecuted the Christians. He burned down Rome, uh, blamed the Christians, and ultimately was forced to commit suicide by the Roman army. And after his suicide, we have two more emperors and ultimately uh, Vespasian, who uh, was over the, the legions in uh, the east and actually was uh, fighting against a rebellious city called Jerusalem when called back by his troops. Uh, claimed as emperor, and he went back to Rome to become the emperor and actually left the destruction of Jerusalem to his son Titus. So Vespasian had been the uh, general, and he left in AD uh, 69. And so when the city was destroyed in AD 70, it was uh, Titus who uh, destroyed it. And then, uh, now we're having fun here. Uh, and then after uh, Titus, his brother Domitian ruled. Titus probably was, uh, was poisoned, um, we believe, uh, intrigue, uh, so that his uh, brother might rule. And his brother, again, is uh, 
not given by name, but is the, is the emperor that, um, uh, that exiled the apostle John to Patmos, where he was uh, given the revelation that is now written in the last book of Revelation in the New Testament. So, um, so we have three Roman emperors, you know, named by name, and yet a number of other Roman emperors had a significant role to play as far as the historical background of the New Testament is concerned. Well, you can fill in a lot of those details. This is not a history class. This is just to learn enough history to get us somewhat aware of what was taking place in the New Testament. Let's uh, move before we take a short break and, uh, and uh, start to understand something of the New Testament itself. And uh, let me just, so where you are, we're, we're on point C now of introduction. The structure of the New Testament. And uh, here is the canonical structure. The New Testament, as you can see, basically has uh, three major divisions. It begins with five books of history, historical narrative. Much like the Old Testament, the New Testament first gives you the historical foundation. And then based upon that history in the letters, if I might put it this way, theological understanding of that history is given to us. And of course, because of that, we tend to preach the letters, because that's where Christian theology is found. And uh, we'll divide this up between the 13 letters written by Paul. At least he affirms his authorship at the very beginning. The Pauline letters from Romans to Philemon. And hold your hats. We'll talk about Hebrews when we get there. But it is listed under non-Pauline because if Paul did write it, he didn't say directly he did. Uh, so we'll put that within what I call the non-Pauline. I, I like that better than Catholic. Catholic means universal, and really most of these letters were not written to, to many churches. They were written to specific believers at a specific time. So instead of saying Catholic letters, I uh, use the term non-Pauline. And then at the very end, we have the final book of the New Testament, the book everyone wants to read. But... It's last for a reason. It's best understood if you read it last. Because it brings together all the strands, not only of the New Testament, but fits what's going to take place with this new spiritual entity, the church, how that fits in to the prophecy already given in the Old Testament. So the better you know the Old Testament, the better you know the New Testament, the better you know the 65 books leading up to Revelation, the more understandable that book becomes. Now, what I've done underneath these breakdowns is to show you how much of the, of the length was devoted to these different divisions of the New Testament. 60% of the New Testament is the history. So I can tell you right now in a survey, we're going we're, we're gonna to do what the Holy Spirit did. We're going to give a, basically the time given to the material uh, based upon the, the length. And I can tell you right now, we're not going to get done with Acts until the middle of Wednesday night. And you're going to say, but then the class is half over. Yeah, well, so is the New Testament. <laughs> All right. 60% of the New Testament are these first five books. So read them. Then we have 34% or one-third that are the letters. And of course, uh, uh, two-thirds of that one-third is uh, Paul. And uh, then we have the, uh, the non-Pauline letters. So we'll spend the latter part of Wednesday and most of Thursday with Paul, and then we'll look late Thursday and uh, Friday with Hebrews to Jude, 
And I know you'd all like to have a whole class on Revelation, but it gets one hour. Because that's all God gave it, as far as the New Testament was concerned. So, we're, we're just following, you know, what the Holy Spirit did. Now, to get an appreciation of the New Testament in comparison with the Old Testament. Now put the whole Bible together, a little over 13% of the total Bible is the Gospels. Only right around 5% of the Bible is Paul and his letters. In fact, all of the letters only make up 7.5%, 7, 7 and just a little over 1% of the Bible is devoted to Revelation. So there's a canonical structure, and it gives you some idea. It's my apology already for how much we're going to time we're going to spend on these uh, different portions of the Old Testament. Now, thinking in terms of the four Gospels, it is very, very significant that with these four Gospels, we have some other parts of the New Testament that are closely associated. Matthew. Matthew, we're going to find out, was written to Jewish Christian believers of the dispersion, probably before the Jerusalem Council of A.D. 49. James is written to the same audience as the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, there is a lot of connection between Matthew and James, particularly as James speaks about the royal law, the law of the king. And, uh, of course, the teaching, the instruction of the king is uh, a centerpiece of the gospel of Matthew. So there's James, of, uh, of anything else in, in the New Testament, is most closely associated with Matthew. And then Mark. And we're going to find out that uh, Mark got his material from Peter. And, uh, and uh, Mark was uh, led to the Lord by Peter and ministered with Peter as well as Paul. And we'll find out that the audience to which Peter wrote is the same as Jude. Now, the audience of Peter and Jude is different than the audience of Mark. But it's interesting that uh, Mark has Petrine elements and uh, so fits very, very well with Peter and Jude. And then Luke, who writes the second volume, Acts, and we'll find out was a ministry associate of the Apostle Paul, who's responsible for all the letters from Hebrews, I'm sorry, from Romans. And we're even going to find out, even if it wasn't Paul, it was a member of, Paul, of the Pauline ministry team that wrote Hebrews. And so Romans through Hebrews. Uh, their background goes to, you know, what Luke has begun and completes in the book of Acts. And then the, the Apostle John, obviously, was responsible for the Gospel of John, and also then three letters and the book of Revelation. In fact, many have talked about the fact that uh, the theology of the New Testament really has these four strands, Matthean, Petrine, Pauline, Johannine. And uh, when you think in terms, okay, um, you've got uh, three of the original apostles of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Peter, and John. And of course, Peter and John were two of the three of the inner three of uh, James, John, and Peter. Went up to the Mount of Transfiguration. So from the 12, you have three of course, when you get to the Gospel of John, you find out among those three, one was the beloved disciple, the Gospel of the, uh, the Apostle John. And uh, so we have uh, Matthew and John. By the way, this is the reason why we'll see that Matthew and John have had, over the course of church history, the most influence uh, because they had apostolic authorship. Matthew and John. And then uh, Mark, as we said, uh, got his insights from uh, Peter. I think put down what uh, he had heard Peter preach. And uh, so we have a Petrine 
And then uh, Luke gives the historical foundation of, uh, of Paul and the Pauline emphasis that is seen in the, the New Testament. And, and to this day, you, you'll, you'll see men who will write about the New Testament and, and uh, just divide it into this uh, fourfold fashion, you know, based upon uh, the, the influence. Now, as far as the literary genres, uh, as you go through the New Testament, you're going to read three different kinds of literary material. The Gospels and Acts are history. They're historical narratives. They're history told in a story style. Now, they're not stories as fiction. But it's not just, uh, it's not just a history book. Those of, you who've, those of you who've gone to school and read a history book, you know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts are not written that way. They're actually interesting. All right. It's not just, just up names and dates and battles. Uh, and prime ministers, and queens, and kings, etc. It, it, it's written in a gripping manner. Now, because it's gripping, because it's narrative, does not mean it's fiction. Everything written is historical fact. But it's written in this interesting way, the Gospels and Acts. And then you get to read some of the people's mail. The epistles, the letters... And by the way, even revelation begins and ends as a letter. But the body of the letter is uh, quite interesting. And, uh, and revelation itself calls itself a prophecy. And uh, so particularly from uh, Revelation 1.9 through 22.5, um, you're reading a, a unique genre, a prophetic genre, that even though it has the epistolary beginning and end, it uh, is it's predominantly a book of prophecy. So here's your, your three basic genres. And of course, you, you read them a little differently because they're having different genres because they're seeking to accomplish different tasks. All right, so we can get to the Gospels. Let's just very quickly summarize the message of the New Testament. And I have summarized the message of the New Testament for you with three basic statements that we're going to fill in over the course of uh, the next nine hours. Number one, we're going to see, God fulfilled his promises concerning the Messiah. In the Old Testament, God predicted an anointed one who would come through the line of David. The one who would be the Messiah, the king of Israel. The king ultimately who would rule and reign over the nations of the earth, All right? In the Old Testament, it's the coming one, a Messiah, a son of David. We get to the New Testament and we find out that that son of David, that Messiah is Jesus. And Christ means Messiah. He is Jesus, the Messiah. So what was predicted of this coming one in the Old Testament is uh, now sent into the world. And of course, we'll see his coming into the world, what, uh, what transpired. But then we'll find out, second of all, that uh, God is at work during this age in the church which is united to the Messiah, Christ. That um, particularly as we get into the book of Acts, now predicted by Christ, but then we see historically taking place in Acts and then explained for us in the letters that uh, God is at work as the gospel goes forth, the gospel of Jesus the Messiah and the impact that that has first upon Jew and then upon the Gentiles. And then, uh, in the Gospels already, and found within the letters culminating in Revelation, God will fulfill his kingdom promises through the Messiah, the Christ, to Israel and the church in the future. That uh, the king has come, but the kingdom has not yet come in its culminating fullness 
Citizen, citizen kingdoms live upon the earth now, but ultimately they will rule and reign when that kingdom is established, when Jesus Christ returns. And so here are three great truths that are seen and really give us the essence of the message that is seen in the New Testament. Certainly, as you read through the Gospels, you see that Jesus spoke greatly about the kingdom. The uh, kingdom is still seen, not as uh, prominently in the book of Acts, not as regularly in uh, the letters, although, as I said, the kingdom elements, the fact that Christ is Lord, Christ is sovereign, Christ is the one to whom we bow down and worship um, those elements are seen as you go through the New Testament letters and, of course, then culminate in the, the actual reign, rule and reign, and the events leading up to that rule and reign of Jesus Christ in the book, in the, in the, the book of Revelation. So these three basic uh, statements, I think, crystallize for us the uh, message of the New Testament. Of course, we, we see that uh, then the... The message of the New Testament, as we take a look, Messiah, 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 Christ, Christ, Christ. The New Testament is a book about Jesus, or books about Jesus. It is, it's, it's, it's centered around the person and work of Jesus Christ. And of course, obviously, the person and work of Jesus Christ only brings honor and glory to God the Father. And, of course, the, the glory of Jesus Christ today is uh, made known in the church uh, through the ongoing ministry of the Holy Spirit. But the, the, the triune Godhead has, has, has designed during this age that we concentrate upon the, the Son, Jesus Christ. And as we, uh, as we come to faith in Him, and as uh, we learn of him, we, uh, we learn of God the Father and the Holy Spirit as well. So, again, I'm, I'm only giving the same emphasis that is seen in the New Testament itself. That uh, it was Jesus Christ himself who told, who told uh, his disciples that uh, the only way to the Father was through him. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's the way to the Father. And even in the Gospel of John, he's the one who's going to send forth the Holy Spirit. Another comfort, another paraclete, uh, just like uh, Christ himself had been. So we don't negate the, the person of the Father, the person of the Holy Spirit, but uh, certainly there is a Christocentric, a Christ-centeredness about the, uh, the New Testament. I mean, brothers and sisters, Read through the New Testament. If you, don't get, if you don't get that this is about Jesus, read it again. <laughs> if you still don't get it's about Jesus, read it again. All right? When you finally see Jesus, all right, you're starting to get the New Testament. All right, from beginning to 